Hey, this is Brent Jensen, and you're listening to No Sleep Till Subray, the show where we talk about the music that makes your skin vibrate. Welcome to the third and final episode of the 2020 No Sleep Till Subray Rick Emmett Christmas episodes. As I explained at the end of the last show, Rick and I were very content heavy this year. He worked really hard to put up some great material for our new Christmas format, and that necessitated a third episode. Considering we only usually do two, it's almost like a bonus episode for you this year. Some extra Christmas joy, and we could certainly use it this year, couldn't we? I know Rick Emmett fans are going to get a lot of joy out of this episode because he talks in great detail about one of his all-time favorite compositions, and he actually breaks that composition down and plays along on guitar to explain why it makes his skin vibrate, which is really cool. And on top of that, he plays one of his own songs to wrap up the show and the series. So, without any further ado, here he is, Uncle Ricky. And I think your Planet Caravan choice is kind of an obvious example and also a good one because that's not what you'd expect from Black Sabbath. So you, right away, you're getting this violation of your expectation. That's it. But you're getting it from an audio point of view. Yeah. Uh, you know, very much. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was a good choice. It Thank was, you. you know, not as good as the next one I have. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. And that is Alfie. Oh, this is the one, buddy. So this is my it. tune of the whole list right is here. It? Oh, yeah. Like, this is just such an amazing song. This is one of my favorite titles. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So just how wide is your dynamic range? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, baby, just how wide is your dynamic range? Yeah. And you, can a song be narrow and wide at the same time? And the answer is yes, this one can. Okay. It's, 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 it's got a narrow dynamic range in a certain way, and it's as wide as the universe in another. So, again, my choice, number one choice for this audio, as for people to reference, would be the version that Pat Metheny plays on his baritone guitar. Track that down. It's from the What's It All About CD. And What's It All About is a line of lyric from Alfie. You, you know, that might give you a sense of where Pat thought maybe that whole album was centered. Yeah. So that by the that Nashville stringing, I'm, I'm looking at my notes now and I can go, yeah, it's the third and fourth strings. The third and fourth. That go an octave higher. Yeah. So anyways... Why am I picking Matheny yet again? Because the, the cinematic scope of this, the, there's a harmonic excellence that exists in Bacharach's writing here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's being distilled down to a guitar, a baritone guitar, which that's the thing that I find so evocative. So there's a soundscaping kind of value in this to me okay. because in a way it helps me because it narrows down the melodrama. Mm. Having said that, there's going to be a thing we're going to talk about this. Uh, there's a YouTube video of Scylla Black performing this with Burt Bacharach ah. in the studio in Abbey Road the day they're laying it down. Mm. And it's just, it's so dramatic. It's unbelievable. The sweep of it is is incredible. You know, I just want to mention this because I want to tee up what the next choice that you made. Okay. The baritone guitar. It's And I mentioned uh, trombones, how, my, how my, I might like that as I'm getting older. Mm. And baritone guitar, it's a deeper, richer kind of sonority yeah. than you know, your regular guitar, certainly an electric guitar that's ripping through a Marshall, right? right? You picked a song, we're going to come up to, which which features, I'm not going to say the song yet because I don't want to give it away, but um, <laughs> it's the vocalist Marcus King. Yes. And he's got this kind of tone in his voice. He's just this guy, like he's so authentic. It's so rich. Oh, you yeah. Know? And he's a young guy, but he's yeah. really got that thing, that vibe in his voice. And his guitar is on you know, that track is just so incredibly right. thick and rich and oh, right yeah. in that ballpark. So a guy of my age, I go, oh, yeah. You know, that just goes directly to my gonads. You know, like that is just so See, amazing. I figured you'd either absolutely love that or be dismissive and say, no, it's... it's no, no, it's it's great. It's great. Yeah. So since we're on that, I'm going to go back to the brain book for for just a couple more here because we're we're getting we're getting close to our sh short strokes here. We are. This is um, sort of about youth and adolescence and middle age and old age. So the idea of aging and how things change for you, right? This can be especially true for people who use music to regulate their mood in a specific way. Someone who wants music to calm her down, or someone else who wants music to pep him up for a workout is probably not going to want to hear a musical piece that runs the loudness gamut all the way from very soft to very loud mm -hmm. or emotionally from very sad to exhilarating. The dynamic range as well as the emotional range 
is simply too wide and may create a barrier to entry. Hmm. We, we are uh, seduced by the dynamic range of things, not just emotionally, but also sonically, right? Yeah. So I said, oh, I'm, I kind of like Matheny's version of it because, man, I'm not so sure I can take the full orchestra with Scylla Black singing. And when I was pl- playing it, and my wife it, would hear it in the office and she goes, oh, her voice is driving me crazy. Can you turn it down? Because she, you know, didn't want to hear that timbre yeah. of that kind of a, of a soprano vocalist, right? Pitch can also, I'm back to the book again, sorry. Pitch can also play into preference. Some people can't stand the thumping low beats of modern hip hop. You know, the guy, he drives his car and oh, you can I still hear it guy. four blocks away. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Others can't stand what they describe as the high pitched whininess of violins. Or when I was young, Rick Emmett's voice, it sounds Soprano. like Kenny Lee. It sounds like a rake on a sidewalk. <laughs> <I did. Yeah. laughs> that was, was that was once in a, re, in a review. Yeah. What? Oh, yeah. A reviewer once said, oh, his voice kind of sounds like a rake on a sidewalk. <laughs> Which record? Which record? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Are you, you know, kidding me? Pick any one of the early Triumph ones. I had a pretty high voice. Uh, well, I know. And so did Getty. I, well, sure. I, yours wasn't as high as his, though. I, I, I sang high as high notes. I just didn't sing them with the same tone. I was Correct. more of a singer. Getty was a little bit more of a eh, salesman. It had a nasal. kind of a quality to it. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I hope he, he wouldn't take that. No, God, no. I, no, I don't no, no, no. I, Getty laugh. Lee is an amazing musician and oh, he's absolutely. a fantastic singer. It's just his voice does have a little bit of that in it. It's an acquired taste. Yeah. I was listening to Allied Forces on the way over here, actually. Oh yeah, good taste of soprano. I think that was one of our best records. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's my. And favorite. I sang, I sang the shit out of a few things on that. You really? I did. sang pretty good. Yeah, but go to the end and fight the good fight, my friend, and tell me that Getty Lee sang any higher than me. I'm sorry, he did not. I hit some notes in there that I think only dogs actually react. Oh, <laughs> the third verse is like yeah, towards the end. Oh, the tag. Oh yeah, yeah. Of your lifetime, every minute, every day. That's it. That's, those are. Those are high, man. I was going to ask you yeah. to play that on my way over. <laughs> <laughs> you sing that I can't do it in those keys anymore. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'm back to my book for a second here. Part of this may be, so this is the question of sort of taste due to dynamic range. Part of this may be a matter of physiology. Mm. Literally, different ears may transmit different parts of the frequency spectrum, causing some sounds to appear pleasant and others aversive. There may also exist psychological associations, both positive and negative, to various instruments. Wow. And, I mean, this is kind of obvious. Like, if you were an orchestrator or an arranger, Mm. if you're scoring a cartoon and somebody's going to be sneaking up on somebody, Mm. it's going to be a slightly darker little instrument. You know, cellos that are being pizzicatoed, boom, boom. Boom, boom, yeah. boom, 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 boom. But let's just say something stupid just happened and a guy fell. Clarinet's going to go, yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? Like they kind of laugh and they have that goofiness to That's them. That's right. If you want something tremendously sad, you're going to go to the key of D minor, which Spinal Tap has said it's the saddest of all keys. Right. And you're going to use an oboe because <laughs> an oboe is sad. It's kind of really sad. It's lonely and it's sad. What does the oboe look like? An oboe is like a little straight black licorice tube, not as big as a clarinet. Oh. Shorter. Yeah. Okay. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Uh, t- t- uh, you know, a flute? Yes. Turn it this way and make it shorter and make it black and it's an oboe. Oh. Yeah. So... I want to recommend to all of the listeners that they go to YouTube mm. and they find, you know, like, type in Alfie, Burt Bacharach, Silla Black, C I L L A, Silla Black, and you're going to find a video that is in black and white that's uh, a few cameras, but shot in Abbey Road Studio One. Mm. Uh, George Martin is producing in the, in the little room, and Burt Bacharach is conducting the orchestra, and it's a huge orchestra, it's like a 48 piece orchestra. They did 28 or 29 takes that day. There's been some, uh, you know, debate as to wow. how many they did. But Scylla Black claims they got into the 30s. Oof. Yeah, but, um, and she sings full out on every single one of them. And she sings her heart out. Yeah. It's so good. So let me give you the background of this tune. Please. Okay. It came as a commission to Burt Bacharach. The opportunity was brought to him by the uh, president of the Screen Composers Guild, mm-hmm. who said, these British guys have made this movie. They, they're looking for, you know, somebody to do it. I think you'd be a great guy to do it. Do you want to do it? He goes, well, send me a rough cut of the movie and I'll, I'll see if I want to be associated with it. 
he sees it and he goes, yeah, you know, I, I think I think it could be good. Okay, you got to get them to send a script to Hal David. I, I live in, you know, Burt Rackrack, I lives in California. Hal David lives in Long Island. Okay. So he's like, got to get send them him, him a script so that he can see it. And he should write the lyric first. And, you know, that's that can be common in in film that you that you get the the the, the lyric first. Hmm. So the lyric came first. Bacharach cuts the demo. This is going to be a long story. Sorry, but it's a good one. <laughs> Bacharach cuts the once he, once they work up the song, he cuts a demo with a, a a male singer, a guy named Kenny. Somebody can't remember. Doesn't matter. And and a string quartet along okay. with his piano. And he sends the demo off to Scylla. And Scylla is managed by Brian Epstein, mm. the guy that managed the Beatles. Yes, right. She tells Brian, "I don't want to do it. I don't like it." Oh. It's stupid. Who would even name their dog Alfie? <laughs> I, I swear to God, I read that as a quote from her. She goes, you wouldn't name a dog Alfie. Alfie's stupid. I, I don't want to do it. Wow. And she goes, get me out of it. And Brian says, mm, I really think you should do this. This is good. This is going to be good for your career. This is a good thing. The connections are really, really good. Burt Bacharach. Don't say no to Burt Bacharach. Yeah. And she goes, okay, well, then let's say this to him. Tell him I'll only do it if he will write the arrangement. Hmm. And Bert Bacharach gets back to her and says, I'd love to. I, I, I'll do it. I'll write an arrangement. I'll write an arrangement that's so great for you. So, and she goes, oh, shit. She <laughs> goes, well, okay, um, tell him I'll only do it if he'll come to London and he'll conduct the orchestra and he'll play piano. And he goes, I would love to do it. She's like, and she, exactly. She's going, oh, God damn it. You got me again. She goes, I can't back out now. I like, you know, I've, I've made so many things. I've got to do this. But she is afraid. She's afraid that it's too much. It's too hard. It's, it's, it's asking too much of her. The dynamic range of it is, is just an emotional range. It's too much for her. But she, she decides, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going for it. But so if you want to, Get the full Monty of the emotional dynamic range. you got to go see that video of her singing it with Bert because it's unbelievable. It shows him his arms waving in the air as he's conducting all of these strings. And then, you know, they get about eight bars in and he sits down at the piano and bling, bling, bling starts playing the piano. Oh, wow. But he's conducting with his head and he's, you know, and she's at a microphone in front of him. She's not even wearing cans. She's just singing, listening to the orchestra in the air and hearing the piano. And wow, like it's just it's so old school, but it's it's so good. So that's the story of the tune. It's short and it's sweet, but it's got so much in it. So I'm getting my guitar here. So that, mm. And I'm just going to sort of walk through it and then, yeah. you know, talk my way through it. Mm. So uh, just checking my tuning. That there was a line in the lyric where some woman says to the, that Michael Caine character, Alfie, what's your little bad, Alfie? So I'm, I'm using that. So... That became the, the start of the tune. So mm. it has this. Mm, what's it all about? Alfie. So I remember in the other songs I showed you, like back way back when we did handbags and glad rags. There's the four there's the four chord over the five in the bass. Yep. So that's what's it all about? Alfie. Is it just for the moment? Very jazzy, very jazzy. What's it all about when you sort it out, Alfie? Are we meant to take more than we give? What an incredible line. Wasn't expecting that. Are we meant to give more than we give a diminished seven chord? Or are we meant to be kind? Where am I here? And if... So now with this, so are we meant to be kind? Now it goes to an F6, and then it goes to an F7 on 5. F, only fools are kind. Second verse, Alfie. Then I guess it is wise to be cruel. And if life belongs only to the strong Alfie, what will you lend on an old golden rule? 
that's an incredibly strange line. Yeah. And the lyric is weird and the melody is weird, but it works yeah. and it gets you to where you want to go and it brings you back. It's the end of the second verse. What will you lend on an old golden rule? As sure as I listen to this chord, believe. Isn't that amazing? As sure as I believe, there's a heaven above our feet. I know there's something much more. Something even non-believers can believe in. Brings you back to the chord that was used at the end of the verse. This was that was the B section. That was a bridge. As sure as I believe, there's a heaven above our feet. I know there's something much more, something even non-believers can believe in. And that's leading us back to the third verse, obviously, right? Yeah. I believe in love, Alfie. And now we're going to go to a coda. This has never happened before in the tune. Without true love, we just exist, Alfie. Until you find the love you've missed, you're nothing. And now here comes a really good one, Alfie. And it's a fermata point. Well, in other words, the orchestra is everybody's going to hold this. And, and the chord is a C7 with a sharp 11, Alfie. So the chord has got a C7 in the bottom, but it's got in the top. And when they do this in the video, she's holding the Alfie. And Bacharach plays a whole note scale. Going up. Ding oh. dong, ding ding ding. In other recordings, he did one later with Dionne Warwick, and he used a vibraphone for it. But there's nothing weirder and more out there than a whole tone scale. Like, you're just going up tone, tone, tone on top yeah. while she's holding this note. So, like, it's this bizarre, amazing <laughs> moment where, and the song is about sort of an existential, hey, what's it all about, Alfie? Like, so here's this moment that it's the pinnacle of the song, yeah. and it's this existential floating off into outer space. It's like your planet caravan thing. Yeah. There's this little moment where it's going like, what is happening? Where right. is this going? It gets it gets to that point, that C7. When you walk, let your heart lead the way. And you'll find love any day, Alfie. Alfie. Wow. So you get these, when his v name gets mentioned, which by the way, it gets mentioned 10 times <laughs> in the song. Ten times we hear the word, but the last two times we hear it over a diminished chord, Alfie, and it's out of the key. We've heard B flat diminishes before. We've heard those, but we've never heard this one, Alfie, Alfie, and now we're gonna go to an ending, very soft, wow. which is the tonic, yeah. you know, but. It didn't seem like it was coming. It was only because it slowed down so much. Anyhow, talk about dynamic range, right? It explores every aspect of it. Notes, sounds, like there's French horns that play counter melodies in this. There's in, in the original recording, but there's counter melodies. There's there's notes inside chords. There's melodies that sit on top. And then there's things that go above the melody that happen. Like it's just in a crazy amount of information. It's two minutes and 38 seconds long. Yeah. And it's got like a symphony orchestra of stuff that occurs. It's insane. It's a, a completely different realm of songwriting. You know, watching you play that, I, I would ask you, like, do people write songs like that anymore, really? Well, 
You're just sounding like, you know, what my father would say. <laughs> they don't write songs like that oh, anymore. Oh, I'm that guy, Rick. Out, Shaking my fist. Every generation <laughs> is that guy. Every generation <laughs> arrives at that point. Yes, there are people that write songs like this. How hard is it to find them? Really hard. Yeah. You know, Burt Bacharach's on the pop charts with a song like this. Are there any songs like this that you can find on the pop charts now? Not a no. chance. Never going to happen. Because... The, our, our music is no longer about that. Our, the culture, our pop culture now, it's about rhythm and it's about hip hop and it's about right. groove and it's it, it's about entirely other things. It's not about the kind of harmonic sophistication that this has. That's when it. I taught at Humber College, my music director was a guy named Denny Christensen. Okay. Denny Christensen used to be the music director for Burt Bacharach. When oh. Burt Bacharach would play, you know, gigs at the Sands Hotel, you know, yeah. wherever. When Bacharach would go on the road, wow. Denny used to be, like, you know, we're talking decades and decades ago. Music like this, it's kind of become, it's more academic now. You know, it's more where jazz lives, where classical lives. They, they, they live in universities and they live in BAs, MAs. Yeah. PhDs, yeah. you know, it's it's become more of an academic thing. It's it's not it's not in the general thing. But you know, there are like Elvis Costello was a guy that sort of grabbed and later in life he he started moving towards this. He right. liked Bacharach, he befriended him. There are songwriters that uh, have the, the the capability. There was a young guy, Ben Folds. Ben, I yeah, think Ben, ben Folds yeah. has the ability to maybe write tunes like this. Mm -hmm. He probably doesn't, you know, just because. You know what market is is there for it? There really isn't one. But exactly. there's a song, there's music like this that gets written all the time for movies. Nowadays, you might find things like this happening in uh, computer games. the The soundtracks for computer games really? sometimes have yeah, incredibly sophisticated orchestral kinds of I would have never imagined harmonically that. advanced kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. And like we live in a world now where you got to dig, you got you know digitally, you got to search. That's it. You know, you got to keep looking. Yeah, because this is just so much now. You know the the uh. We're, we're off on a tangent now, my oh, friend. But, you know, the, the, the barriers dropped. You know, as soon as digital technology made it so that anybody could be making a record in their basement on a laptop, right. you know, then there was just going to be so much music. And there is yeah. so much music now. And so it's very devalued. Copyright is devalued. Everything's devalued. So we're at a point where a guy like Bacharach, he's not going to be the cream that rises to the top right. of the industry because the industry doesn't recognize that kind of cream anymore it just right. doesn't happen but now it's more you know are you a guy that comes up with good beats then you know eminem will give you a call and i suppose at the end of the day after having you know that kind of exchange i would just say i'm thankful that i actually have a little bit of an appreciation for that i guess and i've been you know as a kid i remember watching and hearing that on, on tv and stuff and i don't know there's just a there's a magic about it yes absolutely I tend to be optimistic about things like this because I'm an artist and I'm liberal minded and stuff. But I, and I feel like this didn't go anywhere. It's still there. You can still listen to Alfie. You can find it. You can, you can, Pat Metheny does a cover of it. Like mm -hmm. the, it still exists. Yeah. And the, the quality of it will always ensure that it exists. That's my optimist speaking. Right. I don't care how much dreck you come up with. You can't bury it. You you won't be able to bury sunlight. You know, as negative as this world gets, as horrible as things become, you can't bury the sunlight. Somebody's going to kick at the darkness till it bleeds daylight. Mm -hmm. And that's Bruce Coburn. I was going to say. Wow. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, that. So, so that's a good segue getting... into a young guy with an appreciation for the classics. Marcus King. Yeah, man. Goodbye, Carolina. This and... was a great choice by you, sir. Oh, thank you. This is a fantastic song, you know? It is. It just really is. And, and you picked it, 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 you said it was the meatiest of what you've chosen. Why? Oh, for sure. You know, it's just the, the song itself. So this, you know, I would say that there's two, there's almost two parts. It's like a song and a half for me. And that's the intrigue. I'll explain that. So the initial song itself, it's just the, the kind of earnest, humble approach. It's like a pick and shovel tune, really. It's just very plaintive. And that's moving for me in itself, just because he gets it. He's yep. a good organic performer. But the real power in this song comes at the very end because it does something that I did not expect. The song stops and there's this kind of swirling outro and you don't know what's happening. And you're thinking like, what are they doing? How are they going to resolve? And it rises out of this swirling into this incredible horn line. And it's brought there by this kind of dramatic drum fill that builds up. And yeah. then it ends with this with this cracking of the snare that it's like... 
you know, so a hand comes through the speaker and grabs him a bit by the shirt and says, listen, you know, it's like, boom. And then this, it goes into this horn thing. And I think like, this has nothing to do with the first half of the song. And it's very kind of sinister and mysterious for me that way, because I think like, well, what are the, is this like a secret message of some sort? Like, it's very odd. You're, you're listening to it and then the guitar comes in and follows the horn line. But then it ends. And I just think, like, what is the, what was the purpose of that? And you sit, and I've done this before. I, you know, the song ends, and I sit there thinking, like, what was his purpose in doing that? I would love to find out. Okay. Well, before I get into the story of this, I'm going to ask you a question. Please. What do you think, what do you feel was the point of doing that? I feel like I'll never know. Like, I, re- I just really... I can't draw a conclusion because that portion of the song, um, maybe it's kind of a, maybe it's an, it's an oral representation of, you know, it ties back to the lyrics of how he feels about, I think the song's about suicide, right? So you, you listen to the lyrics and he's talking about leaving. So I think that the song is, is about one of his friends that killed himself, but he also left Carolina, hence the title Goodbye Carolina. But I, maybe it's just this kind of, um, I don't know. It's like an oral representation of, of, of the swirling feelings that he has inside. I don't know. That sounds. I think, pretty... No, I think you're. I think you're really close to it. You know, mm. and I don't know either. I can only give you my, my educated guess. Mm. Okay. Yeah. But my educated guess is, I the song's about life and death, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So, and then I, a very existentialist kind of way. We just had a song. What's it all about, Alfie? Right. You know. Yeah. What's life all about? Yeah. Right. And this is from the point of view of somebody that died and and took their own life. Right. So death is very much. And what is death like? And what happens when you die? Mm-hmm. You know, like we don't know. So it's it's a mystery. Yeah. And what did Dylan Thomas say about what we should do about death? He says we should rage, rage at the at the losing of the light. Mm. Okay? I think my yeah. take on it yeah. is if this is about the producer of the record, and I'm not sure that it's uh, Marcus King, the artist. I, I don't think it is. Okay. I think it's the producer, Dave Cobb. Mm-hmm. And Dave Cobb is a heavy dude. Dave yeah. Cobb has got chops. Mm. Dave Cobb has done Jason Isbell, Sturgill Simpson, Chris Stapleton. He did, you know, remember Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper? Yes. Yes. Oh. He oh. did the music for uh, Star is Born again. Okay. So this guy knows his shit and he's he, rival sons. He produces nice. bands like that. Like this guy knows his stuff and he understands Southern pedigree all the way back to the shit that I know, like yeah. Allman Brothers. You know, like there's a lot of Almond Brothers in what this guy, yes. Marcus King, you know, like he grows up, I don't know, down the highway from uh, Warren Haynes. Warren Haynes, he plays in Almond Brothers. He plays in Government Mule. That's like right. this guy, Dave Cobb, knows this stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, what is one of the prevailing uh, aspects of Southern rock is their jam bands. They yes. get going and they jam. And where do the jams go? The jams go... To outer space, you yeah, know, yeah. just like your planet caravan choice, <laughs> these things are about we're going to go. We don't even know where we're going. When we die, we don't even know where we're going, mm. but we're going to go somewhere. Mm. But when I go there, I'm going to be fucking mad. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to get mad at it because I'm not sure I want to go. I'm not sure I want to. I'm afraid. Yeah. So there's all of this uh, melange, this mix yeah. of of fear and anger and and mystery yeah. is part of that tag on that tune uh, it's so big it's so gigantic mm-hmm. right and it's based on the weirdest of musical things the most open of and i'll get to that when i pick up my guitar but uh i think you're pretty close you know when you say i don't know what it is and uh, that i think that's what they want it's mysterious and i think they want that the power of mystery is one of the things that they want to just reach out and grab you by the throat and say, you know, maybe don't kill yourself. Ah. You know, like, wa- don't do this. Live instead. Mm. Live here where there's sound and fury. Yeah. Be here, you know. So let's go back, okay? okay. And let me read to you what Marcus King has said okay. about the writing of this song. Okay. Okay. I was in a hotel room in France and I had a bit of a writer's block situation going. I was in the hotel bed staring at the ceiling. Then I saw a premonition of a good friend of mine that had killed himself a year prior. Now, he uses the word premonition. 
I don't think he means premonition. I think he means apparition. Uh-huh. You know, I think he just used the wrong word. Oh, premonition. But, uh, you know, so if I'd written this, folks, I would have put brackets and I would have put seek, S-I-C. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm not taking credit for the word premonition. <laughs> I saw a premonition of a good friend of mine that had killed himself a year prior. It really freaked me out. And the rest of the song just wrote itself. Mm. The friend was a fantastic songwriter. And I wrote the song from his perspective. When I play it now, it feels like I'm playing a piece of his music. So the song is in part about me leaving Carolina, but also in memory of him leaving Carolina in a very different way. So uh, you you talked about these things when you were discussing it, and you know you're you're very very close to what his intention was. But let's just go back to the like. First of all, I need to tell you this. When yeah. Marcus King plays this live, he, yeah. does, he doesn't usually do the ending part. What that you mean? that ending part that has the oh, swirl right. and then the, the the piano chords and then the horn line really? and then his guitar comes in and it's just baking on yeah, top. Yeah. You know, not he doesn't do that. He finish he plays just the sort of the Appalachian folk song part of the song right. and it ends. Really? Yeah. So he only ever plays this you know, this kind of I'm gonna give myself a little more trouble. There are there are bar each. So there's your four chord yeah. loop, which takes us, you know, back to handbags and gl- yeah. glad rags. That's his verse. Like that. Those four chords. And then his chorus comes in and goes, so Goodbye, Carolina. It's an Appalachian yeah. folk song, and it's kind of a ballad. It's kind of a sad lament. You yeah. know, it's got that vibe. His voice is so good, oh, so rich in character. Yeah. And then later, when he comes in with his slide parts, oh man, is that guitar ever right. like that? Just you know, I won't say what it does to me, but <laughs> it does physical things to me. That guitar tone just does things to me, and it's so rootsy and authentic. You know, it's it's. It's the exact opposite of a folk you like, say, Paul Simon, yeah. who's very, it's it's thin and it's controlled. But Marcus is is, is much more right down in the, the Carolina soil for that, you know, that, oh, yeah. that Appalachian dirt, you know. Yes. Okay, so let's deal with the, the monster in the room, this gigantic ending that happens. Yeah. So he gets through all of that, and then the swirling starts. And this is why it's a producer thing. All of the stuff that we talked about before about soundscapes, mm. that's what's starting to happen here. It's a soundscape. And it starts with this swirling thing, and then there's a piano that plays. They're kind of like parallel fourths. And they're they're kind of just floating. But there's also, they're bigger than that. They're like 11 chords. So there's like, so like... They're, 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 they're wide open, right? So uh, much easier to play it on a piano than on a guitar, the, the range of those things. But you can't see it, but you're, you're like stretching. I was trying to, but yeah. now I'm just doing them easier. So there's this kind of, you know, and some of them are going up and coming back down while some are still going up. It's really open and wide. And then a bass line comes, and the bass line goes... but it's got a little bit of a modal thing in it. And then the horns start playing this line. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Over this. Right? But think of this. I, I want you to hear this. Instead of just that single bass note, I want you to hear this like. It's 
now it's even bigger. It's like military. It's it's like marching armies. You know, it's, exactly. it's huge, right? But it, on top of this, there's this, but it's up a it's up an octave. So you're getting you're getting this at the time of your game. Right, so now you're getting this. Yeah. yeah. I love that you figured all this out. But it goes one and right. You can feel the jam starting because you got this. You can hear the guitar coming. And and so you got horns that are playing this big huge thing, got this walking thing, and the, and he, oh, you mentioned that, that here crack. it's eights. One. And I used to say to uh, musicians all the time, look, you start out with quarters. One, two, three, four. Then you go one and two and three and four. And and that's rock. Yeah. Rock is eights. Okay. okay? Funk is sixteenths. Yeah. But eights. Bang, ding, 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 of life, yeah, you know, in the jam that's going to be sort of southern rock, Allman Brothers, going to just set it up so the guitar player can just blow his brains. And you, once it's up and running, you can play all of this stuff like. Nice. All that that's blue so stuff, great. you can go with a hairy sound tone yes. like you just as big as you can get it and you just blow your brains out over that wall of sound that marching army thing of of that bass line now you know it strikes me as this is the producer that he, he said no you know i want to do this thing i want to this i want an epic moment and i want a chance for you to blow your brains out and i want to take this song from your appalachian folky you know sadness of of your leaving this departing thing but i want to take it to the bar, the dylan thomas rage against uh. it like that's he wanted to create that emotional sweep mm -hmm. i could be completely out to lunch no, <laughs> right I, I, but that, that makes that's the way it all hits me it makes sense yeah yeah so it's epic isn't it incredible yeah yeah it, it's really really amazing yeah. yeah i think it's fantastic that you figured out all those parts yeah, well, it took me a while. I had to sit down, you know, like I said, my friend Brent Jensen sent me this thing and he, it was a song on a list and I went, mm, well, I better do some due diligence. <laughs> I'm not trying to figure out what the hell. Because the first time I heard it, I went, oh, what? Like, it was just, all right, wh what is that? See? Yeah. It, yeah. And that's, I think, the controlling factor when you're listening to this is, is that astonishment and we talked about unpredictability before like how like it's just so rich it's like you know those maxell commercials from the 80s where the guy's got his hair back sitting in the yeah. chair that's how i felt when i heard that it was like mm. so you talk like soundscape you know that that thing for your brain yeah like this is it to the nth degree like it it, it satisfies that but violating expectations yeah hell yeah, yeah. Uh, coming out of an appalachian folk song yeah hell yeah, yeah. like you know yeah it, it's kind of satisfying so many if you like music there's no way you can listen to this and not go you might not like it <laughs> you you know you might not go oh i can't wait to, to hear that again yeah but you've got to respect it oh if, yeah you've got to understand that that is music doing what music can do you know? Well said. Yeah. Yes, exactly. You just did it right on the head there. Yeah. Yeah. And wow. uh, that's why I think a producer made that choice. You know, not necessarily. I yeah. could be wrong, you know, because there's horns involved. There's 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 a band. And, and Marcus King has said in interviews, oh, I wanted the band to feel like they were a much more integral part of it. But I also wanted my songwriting to move to the next level. Ah. Blah, 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 blah. There's all that stuff. So there's lots of, there's lots of, it's a cast of thousands that could have influenced it or made it happen. Well, but somehow I'm I'm picking the the Dave Cobb guy as being central to it. 
Let's see if we can get him on the show. Maybe we'll find out. Huh, you know, that'd be great. The horse's mouth. He would know. make a great guest. Never know. Yeah. Never know. I mean, imagine if you, if you could get to the bottom of Bradley Cooper, Lady Gaga, the Hollywood stories. Oh, man, that'd be amazing. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we have got one final tune left. It's have we time. made it to the end? We have made it to the end, believe it or not. It's been a marathon. Thank God. I'm, so, I'm exhausted. And sorry? there's been tears and there's been blood. I know. We've covered the full gamut. <laughs> tears, blood, laughter, all of it. Oh, for so, Christmas. <laughs> so this oh, is a dear. great way to end. This is uh, your own tune. It's Cobalt Blue. From the bonfire sessions. Yeah, this is a piece that this is like uh, sort of the last thing that I wrote for the sessions. Uh, uh, there's a kind of a long story behind it. There's a, a, a great late Canadian guitarist named Ed Bickert. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd had the great pleasure of working with Ed on a couple of occasions. You know, I consider him to be sort of, uh, you know, one, one of the legendary guitarists. He was very soft-spoken and uh, humble, mm -hmm. uh, but he had such a huge advanced sense of harmony and, and uh, he had a beautiful bluesy melodic approach in his playing. And so I wanted to write something that would uh, uh, sort of pay tribute mm -hmm. to that aspect of him. And I had a, a, a line of a poem in, in, in my notebook and it said, climb the mountain path, in shades of cobalt blue. So I was thinking about sort of shadows and, and you know, the, the idea of always reaching for something, you know, trying to uh, achieve, attain, you know, so moving. But there's a, a kind of a sadness to all of this, a kind of a bluesy quality to, to life, uh, a, a melancholy kind mm. of quality. So I was trying to capture all of that. And I just kept trying to write little melodic phrases that fit the the lyric line Shades of cobalt blue, shades of cobalt blue. All of the phrases became like blah dee doo doo da, blah dee doo da doo. So that's pretty much. It's just a collection of that. That then it was like, how do I make it make sense from A to Z, and how do I make it make sense to the spirit of Ed Bickert? Right. So those were the things that I was aiming for. I think it ties to you know what we've talked about today in a lot of ways because. It's very lyrical, and the harmonic content is is pretty high. It's fairly sophisticated, mm -hmm. but by the same token, this is very, very straightforward, simple. It's a soundscape more than anything. It's about the the changes, mm -hmm. you know. And I don't think there's a guitar player alive that is going to be lying on his deathbed that's not going to say, "Yeah, I, I just wish I could make a few more of those changes." You know, yeah, I just, yeah, I, just yeah. I want to catch a few more changes. You know. Anyways, so that's what it, that's what it's all about, and it, it's called Cobalt Blue. All right, take it uh, away. I'm gonna just shift myself so that I can get into a better position for playing, and good luck to me <laughs> because <laughs> it's not like I've warmed up or anything. <laughs> Give myself just a tiny bit more. Okay. Thank you. 
Well done, sir. Thank you. I like that. You know, it's a, it's a great tribute. It's wistful, but there's the brightness to it. There's a little, uh, in the B section in the middle, there's a little uh, sort of descending sequence of chords that uh, I'm kind of stealing from. Um, Toot Steelman's had a thing called Bluesette. Mm -hmm. And there's a little thing in there, like, ba -doo -dee -doo -da -doo -dee -doo, as it walks down. And I'm thinking, Ed would be happy with that. He'd like little things that are maybe coming from other harmonic yeah. little places, you know. There's a, an old phrase about... Uh, standing on the shoulders of giants mm. you know like we don't see the weight of the future unless we're you know we put ourselves in a place where we're trying to use the, the greatness of others that have preceded us and ed bickard is someone that in the same way the guitar players owe tremendous debts to Jimi hendrix and 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 you know stevie ray vaughn and i mean eddie van halen passed away west montgomery uh, charlie christian eddie lang you know, you can just go back through the history. There's, we, we owe so much to so many. But here in Canada, we don't have as deep a, a, a long a line, you know, necessarily. But Ed Bickert deserves to be, um, you know, memorialized in lots and lots of ways. A pretty important musician. Well, yeah. you've done that in spades. Well done. Thanks. That brings us to the end, my friend. Wow. 310. We did. <laughs> We it did it. Four hours. Wow, well, the union's not going to be happy. But... <laughs> uh, oh, it's been fun. I enjoyed myself. That's another Christmas special in the books, another year that I am very grateful for a lot of things. Your time, your hospitality, the commitment that you made to this in terms of effort was incredible. You learned all these songs. You contributed myriad facts. You, I, I just, I, I love that you're so involved and engaged in this. It just, it, I can't tell you, you know, what that means to me. It, it's a big deal, and I really appreciate it. Right, thank uh, you. You're welcome. It, you know, it, in many ways, it's my pleasure. I, you know, I, I used to tell my students. You know, one of the reasons that I love to teach is because I get to learn so much from, from the process, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't get to go and teach, you know. But in a way, when I do something like this, I think, well, this is a chance to learn. This is a chance to... So, you know, and instead of it just being me pontificating and yak, 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 I, I like the fact that I, I go, hey, Brent, you, wh wh what are your songs and why? You know, mm -hmm. and so now I get this and that sort of get allows me to... Well, there's things I can check out and other things that I push in other areas. And then, again, you take it back as a reflection. You go, so I went, I made this journey. Yeah, but this is why I like that journey. This is about me. This is what I, how can I get more of me in there? I'll make it some choices based on. So, you know, I, I just enjoy the process. It's fun to do. I'm glad. Thank you very yeah. much. You're welcome. Yeah. I'll see you next year. You bet. Okay. I hope so. Right. I will be here for sure. Okay, man. All right. Merry Christmas, everybody. This has been No Sleep Till Sudbury with Brent Jensen and my very special guest, Mr. Rick Emmett. Till next time, take good care. Brent Jensen is the best-selling author of No Sleep Till Sudbury, Leftover People, and All My Favorite People Are Broken. All titles available in stores and on Amazon Worldwide.